So let me just uh, uh, write down the topics that we'll cover in the next hopefully 10, 15 minutes or so. So we'll talk about postulate of special relativity. And I think the best way to organize this would be, let me do a split screen so that on the left-hand side, I can kind of write and draw things. And on the right-hand side, I can look up the textbook as needed. So, um, so these are the postulate of special relativity. Um, so let me just copy over the first the postulate of special relativity first. In the interest of time, I'll just uh, do the screen capture so that I don't have to write it all out. This is what first the postulate says, and we'll uh, try to make a sense of that, hopefully. And this is what second postulate says. And second postulate, I think the way to normally state it sometimes it looks a little bit mysterious. So we will um, make sure to spend enough amount of time on that. The, I, I think the first postulate is the easier one. The first postulate of special relativity says, the laws of physics are the same and can be stated in their simplest form. Um, I don't know what the second part means. <laughs> or I, I think we can ignore that safely. I mean, I mean, I do know what it means, but we're not using vector notation. So the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames of reference. And I like to I like to give all my laws a nickname or some way I can refer to them quickly without the first postulate of special relativity. We've done that with the Newton's laws of motion. We've done that with the laws of thermodynamics and we're doing the same thing for the laws of what, what we could call laws of special relativity except we call it postulate. This is what one, you, one could call principle of relativity. And it's actually, um, it's a very old idea. The origin of principle of relativity, you can trace it back as far back as Galileo. Galileo um, had one of his uh, thought experiments, except he didn't call it that. He imagined a sailor who's sleeping in the uh, cargo holds of, or I guess passenger compartment of a, a ship going, uh, vessel and imagine a very calm uh, day where the ship isn't shaking so much and uh, the, the sailor wakes up and tries to figure out is the ship moving or not and um, and when you try to think through the scenario eventually you should uh, come to a conclusion that the only way the sailor can figure out that the ship is actually moving is by reference to some outside thing. Uh, he might, he or she might be able to look out the window. Uh, I guess, yeah, they did have glasses in Galileo's time. So they might have a window. He could look outside, see a fish moving relative to the ship. Then there would be the question of, is it a fish that's moving or is it a ship that's moving? Or he could uh, get out, get on the deck, look at the land far away and see that compared to the land the ship is moving. And uh, also modern folks have a similar experience. If uh, you've ever been on an airplane and um, if, uh, uh, if you are kind of imagine falling asleep and uh, waking up, if you have a quite uh, uh, turbulence free ride, you should uh, be able to find that it's uh, quite difficult to, uh, to figure out from your feeling if the airplane is actually moving or uh, if it's uh, on the runway, just to win the, with the engines running so that it's loud. So, um, or, you know, you don't even have to refer to airplane if you're on BART and, you know, you have your eyes closed and uh, either you have your ears plugged or you kind of ignore the noise, then as long as the BART train is moving at a constant speed, constant velocity, you can't quite tell by feeling whether it's moving or not. The only way you can tell that it's moving is by looking outside, by looking at the uh, other 
as other uh, aspects of station or other surrounding that you think of as a stationary to that you can figure out the train is moving relative to the ground. So, so that's a, the principle of relativity. And I think that's uh, quite intuitively acceptable to most people. So where we need to more spend more time on is uh, what's called second postulate of uh, special relativity. And I think uh, where it says this, the speed of light C is a constant independent of the relative motion of the source. At first sight, um, like if that's the very first thing that you're hearing, that should sound, um, that I think that should sound unreasonable because um, following the principle of relativity, uh, this is normally our thought process. Imagine this, okay, let me try to draw straight lines. I'm trying to draw my level ground. Imagine a car or a cart that's propelled somehow. Either someone pushes it or it, I don't know. Imagine a cart and uh, it's got a thing mounted on it. Maybe it has, uh, it has a, a ball launcher mounted on it. And this ball launcher is able to launch a ball at speed V0, at some speed. It's got a spring loaded thing. You uh, press a button, spring, it opens the gate or spring pushes down. And you've measured the speed of the ball, um, kind of when the cart was at rest. And you see that, oh, it, this thing launches the ball at speed V0. Now, if you imagine this situation changing so that the cart is either moving in one direction at speed U, or to make it fun, you can uh, make it move the other way. If you imagine the cart moving the other way at speed U, then I think most people can figure out what would be the speed of this ball if it's being measured relative to the ground. So being measured relative to the ground. Uh, in this scenario, I think most people, after some time of thinking it through, you would say that the speed of the ball is V0 minus U. Uh, in this particular scenario, the way I've drawn it. Or if, uh, if you change the picture so that the cart is actually moving in the same direction as the ball, then you would say, again, trying to measure the speed of this ball, not relative to the cart, but relative to the ground, you would intuitively say the ball should be moving at the speed V0 plus U. It kind of adds this speed of cart. And, and this is all, um, it, it's all consistent with the principle of relativity and the relativity that we are used to thinking of before um, the ideas of special relativity. This is in fact given the name Galilean relativity, as in this is the kind of relativity that, um, that Galileo, the relativity that Galileo would have thought of. And, uh, th and this is where you get, uh, uh, you would kind of com compare your existing physical intuition with this uh, statement and get a sense that this doesn't sound quite right. Because if you imagine replacing this ball launcher with not a ball launcher, but a laser pointer. So I have a laser pointer that's going to fire up a beam of light. And um, I think we covered the speed of light way back when we did optics. Oh, where did we do it? Uh, chapter 12 is when we did optics. And speed of light is C. So you know that relative to this laser pointer, the light is moving at speed C. So it's the, um, so if someone were to ask you, um, if someone were to tell you, now I've put this uh, laser pointer on a cart and the cart is moving at speed U. Following this same idea, you would say, oh, the, the light from the perspective of someone who's on the ground, it should be moving at speed, um, it should be moving at speed C plus U. That's what you would say uh, intuitively. And what I'm here to tell you is that that intuitive idea 
it's actually in contradiction with the principle of relativity. It's, uh, uh, this is not consistent with the first postulate of special relativity. Uh, and this is why, let me remind you <laughs> of what we covered in chapter 12. We covered in chapter 12, um, what leads to the speed of light. So you go back to chapter 12, <laughs> you look at Maxwell's equations. This is the theoretical grounding for, um, for our understanding of light, electromagnetic wave. And, and you know, all of this is something that requires a differential multivariable calculus. So, so you know, we're not doing all that, but we need to talk about how um, you know, there are these things that we call four equation, four Maxwell's equations, and they can be described in these qualitative terms. And I just want you to understand that there are four laws of nature that stand behind on each of these statements. Now, one of the contribution that Maxwell made and the reason the equations that correspond to these are called Maxwell's equations, is that um, Maxwell introduced the term um, that uh, shows that changing electric fields create magnetic fields. Um, that's analogous to magnetic fields being generated by changing electric fields, Faraday's law, uh, which we talked about in the terms of electric motors. So with the addition of this, he was able to work through the math and predict uh, existence of something called electromagnetic wave. And one of the key aspects of his prediction was that as part of his prediction, he predicted this value, that this should be the speed of that electromagnetic wave. And this is what I mean. This statement, this uh, guess here, is in conflict with the principle of relativity. This is speed of light. This is a theoretically predicted value. And the theory that predicts this value relies on the laws of electromagnetism. So if you believe that in the first postulate of special relativity, it says that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference of frame, and if you believe, as you should, that the laws of physics includes Maxwell's equations, if it includes the theory of electromagnetism, then you are forced to, into saying that, if you believe that, then you, you are forced into saying, yeah, Maxwell's equations are the same in all inertial reference frame. And since, through Maxwell's equations, there's the prediction that speed of light should be, there's an actually analytical expression for it. I think it's a square root of, oh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it is. I think it's epsilon naught mu naught. Uh, I have the right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. Let me just double check to be sure so that I don't leave in my lecture something that's actually incorrect. <laughs> when you look into useful information and you look at um, the speed of light, why is it not giving me? Okay, I think I can do it this way. Uh, that's epsilon not in SI units. That's a mu not in SI units. Okay, uh, I'm pretty sure it's a one over um, square root so this should be, um, so speed of light is, uh, let me just fix up the formula here. It's a one over square root of E naught mu naught. Yeah. So, um, so Maxwell's equations predicts this. And it, it, so if you truly believe in the principle of relativity, then it should hold that this expression here, which follows from laws of, um, uh, electricity and magnetism, that this also should not change depending on what reference frame you are in. So that's the sense in which um, this, this guess here is contradicting the first postulate mm -hmm. of special relativity. So um, if what I'm saying is all correct, you, then you might wonder, so um, 
if a first postulate of special relativity already implies all of this, then why is this needed? Like, why does why do we need to state this? Uh, so this is the nickname I give to the second postulate of special relativity, which might sound silly in uh, at, from the modern point of view, but I will explain why it makes sense. It, uh, so this is the nickname I would give to the second postulate. It, the nickname I would give is correctness of theory of electromagnetism. That, that's a weird thing to say about fit law of physics to assert that it means correctness of one of the theories of uh, physics. But um, so it's a more of a historical thing because the whole theory of electromagnetism, if you um, remember reading it through in chapter 12, um, I think I described the, give the historical background that uh, James Clerk Marx, Maxwell, uh, who died in this time in the late 60s is when he put together Maxwell's equations and actual electromagnetic wave wasn't detected until after his death. So I think uh, all of that was experimentally set settled in the 1880s. So, and Einstein published his papers on special relativity in the early 1900s, 1910, 1911, I think. So you have to look at that. There has been only really about 30 years since the completion of the theory of electromagnetism to the development of special relativity. And actually what's happened in that those 30 years is that people have noticed the contra inherent contradiction between this and the, um, the prediction that you would get from Galilean relativity. And most people were assuming that, hey, Galilean relativity that's been around forever, it's probably correct. We think it's the theory of electromagnetism that's incorrect and needs to be corrected. That's what most people were assuming for 30 years. And they were trying to make a corrections this way, that way. So the bold new thing that new thing that Einstein was asserting was that it's the electromagnetism that is correct. And what we need to change is our ideas of mechanics. And so that's why it really deserves its own statement to boldly assert that the theory of electromagnetism is indeed correct. And what we will now move on to do is change our ideas about uh, mechanics.